Hello, all, and welcome to the Fantasy and Sci-Fi Fanatics Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Kubal. Today, I have with me a very special guest, L.L. McRae. How are you doing today, Lauren? Hey, I'm good. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, really looking forward to this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always love when I get somebody early on a, a Sunday or a Saturday. Uh, it really starts the day off right. I did yesterday uh, for the morning and the afternoon. Uh, so it definitely helps me right throughout the day. So this always helps jumpstart me, uh, if you will. Uh, we'll start right in there with that first question. <laughs> if I don't die first, uh, <laughs> what has your writing journey been like up until this point? Um, I would like to say it's quite straightforward. Um, I imagine you, you talk to a lot of authors who tell you that, you know, as kids, they were always the one with their nose in a book and I was kind of the same. Um, the books that I was always drawn to always had magic or dragons or adventure or alternate worlds, that kind of thing. I was always much more drawn to the fantasy side of reading than, you know, the more kind of classical set in London and everything is miserable. I wanted magic. I wanted <laughs> fly on dragons. Um, I wanted that sense of adventure. Um, and also growing up, I played a lot of the Final Fantasy video game series. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So that I would say even more than books was what really kind of introduced me to mm. epic stories and, you know, narrative scope and all of these morally great characters and that kind of thing. Um, so w when I grew up, I always wanted to know I wanted to write for a living. Um, being an author isn't super easy to do for a living. So um, I didn't start off being a, a fantasy writer. Um, my background's actually in marketing communications. Oh, so cool. I was writing. Um, it was just about less exciting things than dragons and magic. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. I've been a copywriter since 2015. Oh. So um, I write all sorts of things for all sorts of companies. Uh, you know, finance, software, technology, medicine, kind of anything that you can think of that a company sells is what I wrote for those companies, oh, wow. um, which was which was fun because I was writing for a living. I would come in, I would get my brief. I would write all sorts of uh, copy from like short tweets all the way through to like onboarding emails and website copy and all of that kind of stuff, which is really good for learning different tones of voices. Um, it's really good at getting messages across. It's really good at teaching you how to kind of drip feed information to people without it being like super on the nose because people don't want to be sold to. They just want to have a good time. So if yeah. you can kind of tease in those little messages, um, you're doing good as a copywriter. So um, when I started writing kind of my own fantasy novels, one thing that's kind of cropped up a lot is I don't do massive exposition dumps. And mm. I think a lot of that comes from my background as being a copywriter because you can never be on the nose. You, you, you have to like, I call it seasoning the manuscript, just a little bit mm. of salt and pepper here, just little nuggets of world building or uh, a bit of lore or background information on a character or a curse or magic or whatever it might be. Um, so I really, despite not writing about dragons, I've been honing my writing craft for quite a long time. Yeah. Um, I was always happiest working uh, on a manuscript of some kind. I really like how sentences sound when they are kind of built in a way that kind of makes sense and flows. Yeah. I know that's really subjective, but um, you know, when you're watching a film and you just hear the way a character speaks and it just kind of resonates, oh, yeah. you know, it, it's just impactful and I really like it's almost like um, a maths equation when you're kind of like connecting these little bits together yeah. to make something beautiful um, and I really like that uh, I don't know if I'm any good at it but I really like doing <laughs> that um, <laughs> so I went freelance with copywriting in 2019 oh, wow. um, so I've done both uh, in-house and on the agency side so I've done kind of the whole scope of that um, but I was always kind of writing books like of an evening, getting up early on a weekend, kind of in and around social life, because ultimately writing about your own ideas is kind of more fun than writing oh, about yeah. this new piece of software that's going to help you sell cars or, you know, something like that. Um, so I published my debut novel back in 2017, March of 2017. That was uh, the first book of my World of Lenaria series. Um, and that was an idea that I'd kind of been having uh, since I was about 16. Just one of those little ideas that won't go away. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and kind of what started that idea was, um, I like dragons. This is going to mm. become very obvious in the interview. If it isn't <laughs> already. Um, so I wanted to do my own spin on dragons. I wanted to have like a dragon hunt that didn't result in killing a dragon or, you know, taking something from the dragon. You know, I wanted it to be a nice kind of spin on a really tired classic trope. Mm. So kind of like the world's greatest dragon hunt was the idea and that kind of uh, escalated into what became the first book. Um, I took part in National Novel Writing Month every year, uh, which is, um, if you don't know, it's a challenge every November where you write 50,000 words of a novel in that one month. Um, and there's a whole community uh, to you know, support you. There are local write-ups. So if you just check what city you're in, you're gonna find other authors, other people doing it. Um, and you get like a, a daily word count where you can uh, see your progress going up and up, which is really quite nice and satisfying to see every time you <laughs> hit your word count target. Um, and yeah, that was, that was kind of like the dream. Um, and after going freelance with copywriting, I decided a year later that I couldn't write books and do the freelance stuff at the same time. It was just getting too much. I was getting too yeah. burnt out. Um, so I took the plunge to go uh, full time as an author in 2020. And uh, yeah, touch wood, it's all going OK. That's where I am now. And I don't feel like I'm treading water anymore. I feel like I'm kind of swimming, um, <laughs> which is nice. Yeah. Um, lots of ups and downs, of course. But uh, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where I am right now, doing it full time and, and hoping to grow what I've managed to build for the last couple of years. Well, that's awesome. I'm definitely going to have you back for our copywriter episode. Um, oh, yes. Emily Inkpen, I'm looking, uh, what is, is doing that as well. And I'm totally blanking. It's somewhere in my notes. If it was, it was another author I have for February, she wrote as well, um, mm -hmm. who was also, oh, um, Seal Perlo actually is trying to get into that so i yeah. what i want to do is is like i want to have somebody we could do one of mine i don't care i'm i don't get embarrassed um or you know we could have i just want like to have people come in and then i just want to actually show what it is you know you do and mm -hmm. i thought it'd be cool to have a little a couple of excerpts or like a page and have the three of you kind of talk about it and because i don't really think people know what copy editing really is like and you know like some people send their story or a book whatever to a copy editor but some don't but I just think it's better it's just such a thing that like I didn't even really think about until probably a few months ago um, when I was listening to um, somebody on another podcast and he talked about how when he switched his copy editing learned how to do it and switched it like that was the only thing he really changed he even changed his writing style and he changed his copy editing on Amazon and other places and his website and all of a sudden his sales went up like 35 percent and I'm like that's a huge shift if you're not changing anything about your writing or advertising like you're just changing your copy copywriting and that's like what he does now so to me that just it's fascinating because I don't think enough people talk about it um but yeah I thought about doing um like a small seminar episode about that uh so ah. I got you down for that so I will <laughs> be sending you the details um pretty soon um I like how you said the seasoning I, I like that that's a good it's a great visual so I really yeah. like that. So definitely stealing that. I'll give you credit though. November, <laughs> November is the worst month for me. Like I'm a teacher and a coach and it's like, it's the end of our season. It's the start of, I always help with the younger girls for volleyball too. So it's like, I, so what I'm doing is if anybody wants to message me and we can do it together, I'm actually doing my uh, NaNoWriMo in July. <laughs> um, I'm taking the summer off to write. I just like, I'm like, I got so irritated the last two years. Cause I'm like, I try and November is just the hardest one. I never get to go to karate either because I'm always just so busy. So I'm like, I'm doing my own month, but it is very helpful. One of my friends, uh, C.S. Radcliffe, he got like, I think like 70, 65,000 words, like 68,000 words. And he's got, he's got a couple of kids, I believe. So I'm like, that's impressive. I don't have an excuse, I guess, but it's very yeah. good if you can find it. I like getting the updates and stuff. I like seeing people like, um, um, Mallory Kuhn actually, um, I think she's now on Twitter as MJ Kuhn, but, um, she, I think it was around 52,000 words or something like that. Like she was crushing it, uh, for November. So I give people credit that I can do that in November. Uh, cause I can't, I'm just too busy at that point. Uh, well, that's really cool. I, 
I'm actually really anxious to, um, when I saw that, I can't remember where I saw that, um, where, I don't know if it was like a tweet or something that you mentioned, uh, or wherever I'm on your socials, when I saw that, you know, you had um, copy edited, I was like, oh, that's really neat. Uh, <laughs> so I always adds a different aspect to the questions, I feel like. Uh, so for that second question there, so how, so you talked a little bit um, about how you came up with your world of Lenari, but can you tell us a little bit more about that? You said it's an idea you've had for a while, but I know a lot of times those are like little kernels, right? Like popcorn and then they sit and then like, when did it really like, you had the kernel, right? But when did it really explode for you? Yeah, I had the, I, li- I like that. I had the kernel, when did it pop? Um, so I, I did, I believe it was Nano in 2013, mm-hmm. I think it was. I was in a, a relationship that wasn't great for me at the time, mm. but I didn't realize it. Uh, as most people I, ironic because that was me too in 2013 <laughs> yeah. well, wasn't the best year um, <laughs> and uh so I would kind of like you know growing up reading was an escape writing was an escape mm-hmm. video games was an escape and so in 2013 uh the nano challenge of that year it was a, it was a real escape for me again so I kind of I don't know maybe I kind of subconsciously tapped into that childlike I'm just having fun, I'm being creative, I'm I'm making my world the way I want it to be, kind of thinking. Um, and I just, I, I did the 50,000 uh, in November. Uh, I hit the target, which was great. And then normally what I did was I would hit that target and stop, be like, right, challenge done, let's move on to something else. But um, this, this kernel was just there. So I continued writing until I finished the first draft. Um, I think it took me until like the following April uh so that would have been april 2014 um and then uh spent two years editing it and passing it back and forth between writer friends and uh editor buddies like nothing professional nothing paid for just can i have some eyes on this it's my first ever start to finish manuscript is it good is it working what can i change that kind of thing um and then that relationship ended uh, and a couple months later, I published the book. So it was kind of like, a, I don't know, I don't want to say it, it helped me, but it, it was definitely a defining part of my life, a, a, a very significant time. Um, a lot of emotion went into that. Um, you know, I killed off a character in it that may or may not have been... <laughs> Uh, well, let's not say more on that, but it better I, I to be in the book, right? Or a story than in real life. So <laughs> well, exactly. we're kind of fortunate in that way. Like if you know somebody cuts you off, you know, or does something new, you can write it in something. Like, yeah, it's totally fine. Yeah, get get the anger out that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was definitely a very raw book. Um, it was very rough around the edges. I published it without going through a proper editor or a proper proofreader. Um, and like the earlier reviews will definitely say, you know, great story, enjoyed it, a lot of fun could do with another editing pass or two and I'm like hands up it was fine it was just my you know I want to write a book yeah. book kind of thing I at that point I didn't want to be an author full-time I just wanted to you know you talk to people and you say oh I would love to write a book one day I'd love to hold it one day yeah and that was what that book was so I didn't put um the same emphasis on it as I probably do now um you know kind of amateur to professional I guess um but yeah, I mean, what went into it, you know, I mentioned Final Fantasy. Um, I loved airships. I loved mm. different towns. I loved uh, different magic systems. I loved, you know, different races of types of people. And I definitely took a lot of inspiration from that. I think I even wrote the first draft to some of the soundtrack to the games. Oh, that's um, cool. A lot of people do that, I've noticed. Like, that's that's been a common theme on here, so... Yeah, yeah it, it makes a difference. I mean, I'm not one to write in silence, so you might as well put something on that evokes that magical, epic yeah. feeling, um, you know, battle music for action sequences and sad music for death scene, you know, all of that kind oh, of thing. Crazy. It really works. Um, I mean, when, when you look at the interv- interviews to these composers, you can, you can see what they're trying to evoke when they write yeah. the music. And it's very similar to when you're writing a certain scene, you're trying to get an emotional response from a reader. Um, so yeah, it, I, for me, it helps. Um, I, I know some people can't write with any kind of noise, but, uh, yeah. I can't me, do silence. It drives me nuts. <laughs> I'm just like, I've my mind is meditating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
yeah it is but uh but yeah so I, I think I thought it, there's a lot of me in that book yeah. um in terms of where I was in my life in terms of my emotions uh, my inspirations um you know if you read the book oh certainly the original version of the book you'd be like mm, yeah I, I, I can see the uh the parallels here <laughs> um and then it, it kind of sold and um it did better than I thought. I mean, a lot of indie authors say that, you know, in a book's lifetime, you won't sell more than a hundred copies or so, but I sold quite a lot more than that in, in not a lot of time. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it was. And then people started inevitably asking, cool, where's book two? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, right, okay, let me sit down and, and turn this into a series. Um, so I think I published the first and second books while I still worked full time. Published the third one when I was uh, just freelance copywriting and then when I went full-time author I published the fourth book and all of the books since have been um, just that's all I do kind of day to day um, but yeah I mean, <laughs> that's all you do <laughs> that's all it that's it's it. all I do yeah <laughs> I mean I wish it was all I did I wish all I did was right but there's so much more to it when you're an yeah. idiot you know oh, yeah. like you were talking about before marketing adverts business cards, conventions, newsletters, growing an audience, connecting with an audience, finding the audience. Um, you know, there's so much to that. And, you know, it's it's an ongoing kind of learning. Um, you learn something new every day, every week, um, a new twist and everything changes as well. So what worked now uh, won't work necessarily in six months or a year. <laughs> yeah, um, look, look at like Twitter, <laughs> like Twitter was huge for me and then they changed their algorithm in October. And now it's like, it's like a desolate desert <laughs> I never even see my friends I have to like go to make a list to go to all of them it's like it's crazy it's the same thing with um like Instagram did I think mm -hmm. it was like last summer and I feel like Facebook's now I went back to Facebook because Facebook didn't really change that much so yeah it's like everything is TikTok you know seems to be on the rise so I'm scared of TikTok. I, <laughs> I have an account but I, I I don't even venture into TikTok waters I'm I'm <laughs> I don't think I'm young enough for TikTok. Um, yeah, it's, but you kind of, I mean, you don't have to, but I think understanding at least some of these kind of avenues helps. Um, you know, you, you do see like I'm on Reddit quite a bit more than mm. I probably should be. Um, <laughs> Very addicting. See, I stay off of it for history because I'll just get like down rabbit holes. Then all of a sudden I look up and like two hours went by and I didn't get any writing done. I know it's like how I swear it's two minutes um but you see so many people posting like oh I published a book and how do I get sales and how do I get reviews and it's, there's just so much research you need to do and you need to constantly be doing yeah um, which is you know one of the downsides to to self-publishing a lot of people always ask pros and cons and yes you have control yes you can write what you want yes you can have the covers that you want but the downside is you have to do everything else yeah um but I would not change it for the world. I'm very happy with what I'm doing. Um, I'm kind of growing. I'm not one of the big boys yet, so to speak, but um, you know, I, I, I see people reading it or talking about my books and I'm like, oh my God, this is real. This is, I don't even know you and you've decided to buy it. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's always a nice milestone. Yeah. I, I, my totally friend just said that the other day. He's like, it's so cool when I just see somebody, cause I like, I, I, when I, when I see them, I like to, I like to share with people and tag them, you know, especially on like Twitter and stuff. Cause it's like, yeah. kind of my, I treat Twitter not as growing audience, but like as my water cooler, I found a lot of, you know, creators and, you know, fellow authors and um, artists and stuff on there. And I love seeing somebody with somebody's book or whatever, cause I'll, I'll, I'll either direct message them or I'll tag them right away. And I just feel like that's, that's got it. I I'm, I'm really looking forward to rapidly publishing next year. Um, you know, just for that whole thing, just somebody random that you don't know is like, Oh, I love this. Like, I feel like that's the thing that keeps me going late at night when I get home from my my job and I'm too tired to write and then I continue because I'm just like that and like you said right like it's cool to you know to actually have your your physical product so your, your baby so to speak so yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, babies I know celebrate the birth of another one soon it's, it's crazy it's awesome my friend <laughs> is like that he's like I want to be like the old woman in the shoe and just you know you popping them out left and right um, so how did you go about your world building uh, for Lenari? Um, so I, uh, I think I kind of, I like world building. I think it's my favorite aspect of writing fantasy. I think it's the main reason I'm drawn to fantasy because mm. it's 
obviously you have urban fantasy or you know the magical realism set in our world but my love is epic yeah. and other world um and i think kind of when you consume media uh be it video game or film or books or you know whatever it might be it, i think it's very natural to think well if it was my world what would it be like if they were my characters what would they want um so i, I i'm always kind of drawn to certain I don't want to say tropes, but I guess they are tropes. But you know, like, I love the idea of an ancient evil. I love the idea of lost magic. I love the idea of dragons. I love the idea of uh, magic, but not just one. So I have, I think I have like three different magic systems in Lenaria. Oh, cool. Or four, perhaps, I'm not sure. I mean, it started with one and then it just kind of grew. Um, so I like kind of taking an idea and just, doing a bit of a deep dive into it and, and pulling out things and then how would a, a, a people or a town be affected by this um so in Lenaria for example I have a race of uh, they're called like storm bringers they're, they they have wings they can fly they can conjure lightning and storms and they're known to be quite devastating people and I'm like okay well they wouldn't really live on the ground would they so I get to have floating cities and I get to have new kinds of buildings and I'm like well if they fly they're not going to have doors on the ground so how would they get in and then oh okay well let's think about like um bigger windows uh without glass or open roofs and balconies and and you just kind of sit with this idea and you're like oh well, what about this and oh but how would that work and 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 you kind of end up in a bit of a rabbit hole um <laughs> yeah <laughs> which, which is a good and a bad thing um but yeah I like to take a couple of aspects that I I enjoy personally um and then okay well how will, how will it fit in this world what would make sense and and um, how can I connect that to something else and you know I have like a, a a race of shapeshifters and then there's another race but they don't like each other so okay right if they don't like each other how does that deep-rooted prejudice work on a day-to-day -day level um what kind of you know what's the vernacular like what kind of insults would they have that would make sense just to them mm. but not to everyone else and then you kind of you know season it into the manuscript so there's a market and you've got these different people and maybe it's an overheard conversation or maybe it's a body language thing or maybe it's a why would you eat that that's from such as you know those kinds of things rather than a whole page of and in, in the before times this is what happened and it was this war from this year to this year and these people died because I don't find that interesting um as much as how it affects the characters that we're following um or the description of the city that we're in or the location that we're in maybe there's you know scars on like the plains and it's a result of this battle but then kind of showing that in a really fun way rather than just a expo dump kind of thing um so yeah i tend to pick a few ideas and just run wild with them and then just grow them and i always try to connect everything to everything else so nothing is on its own because it has to be cohesive it's part of the world it's not just 10 things i like and let's see what happens it has to be kind of rooted in you know if not an exact history then a people or a place or a um sayings or you know something like that that's more tangible um which i think helps readers connect with it because there's prejudice in our world so you can kind of see similarities there and then you can just extrapolate okay well it's only this magic that is slightly different to our world rather than it being too confusing or too complicated um and i try to start off very small and then grow as the story grows um so it, it's almost on a need to know basis um i know a lot of authors struggle with where do you stop world building and start drafting um and I, I think I, I spoke to one guy, actually, a, an acquaintance of mine, who said, oh, yeah, I'm writing fantasy as well. Um, and I have, I think he said something like three or four hundred thousand words just of world. <laughs> <Wow. movie." laughs> and I'm like, Whew. I mean, good for you. But wh where are you going to do your story from this? And he's like, yeah, I have every battle, every uh, every location, like every character's ancestry backed 15 generations. And I'm like. You're really not going to need all that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you you really aren't, and it, it's fun, but you you have to be very aware that do you just want to create and and world build, which is perfectly valid, or do you actually want to write a book? Yeah, because I think they're two very different things, and yes, they are that there's some overlap. Yeah, but they yeah. are very different things. Um, and I think once you just have enough 
you can start your story and then if you get to a new location and you're like right this is sparse let's do a bit of world building for yeah. the next two weeks and flesh this out and then continue um I, I you know it's better to start with less and grow it than too much and be overwhelmed with where do you start Wh whose story is this what's yeah. the point of the story what's the plot because there's so much that you can take from um but if you are successful then obviously you can build a huge universe from it which is quite quite cool yeah um i think with your debut just be very aware of are you procrastinating now or are you actually adding to something useful i guess yeah. sorry that well, was good <laughs> no 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 i got a lot out of it um so when emily Inkfen and i were on for february she wrote she made a good point she like she i just like how she said and probably not saying it right but when i asked her that question she was like oh i start with the character and I come mm. up with a character and a little bit of where they are in the world. And then that's like a small circle. And she's like, and then I only worry about what touches them yes. or then another character. And I was like, oh my God, that blew my mind. And um, yeah, like I, I, I was doing that for a while. I was like, oh, I'm going to world build. And then what I noticed for this one book, I got like the, this desert setting. I'm like, well, I was like, okay, like it's great and all, but like it stopped me from actually finishing the story and yeah. then I was like well this character had this, this tribe right I wanted to be like a veteran tribe um and have some cool historical context for you know why they did certain things and then just tweak it a little um yeah. I also didn't want to steal from different cultures so I was trying to figure that out and I couldn't really navigate it and yeah it just it kept me from finishing the story because I got frustrated because that was a point where I was like oh, I'm going to scrap everything else and then just worry about when he interacts with these people mm -hmm. and I, then it just it just got too much in my head and I feel like now that was like a year and a half ago two years ago it's like now I have completely different ideas for that so I feel like all that world not like all but most of that world building I did was completely pointless because I'm just going to change it anyway and I feel like that's a lot like 300,000 I think it's a lot because I'm more of a discovery writer anyway like once I get going like then I'm like oh but that's cooler I do the same thing with teaching like I'll come up with plans today and then for whatever reason first thing tomorrow morning I'm like, nope, this is better. <laughs> it's like, I have to change it anyway. So now I'm, I, I do loose plans like I do for writing and then, you know, get used to changing it. I just, yeah. world building is great, but I don't think you actually understand where you're going in the world until you understand the characters better. So now yeah. what I've been doing is I've been doing a loose outline, just writing. And then, you know, like draft two for my first book, it's like, there's so many things that I'm ready to add and change. And I'm like, oh, that's way cooler than any other world building I did previously. <laughs> so that dictionary I have, I already have to change it. So it's like, <laughs> why did I spend like, you know, a month during the pandemic oh, no. worrying about it, you know, but it, it did help, you know, character wise and stuff. But yeah, it's, I, yeah, what is it? The iceberg method, they always say, you know, and I'm, I'm finding like, I want to be more efficient and yeah. creating a huge iceberg that I'm only going to use a little bit. And, you know, maybe you use something else a bit later or whatever, but I don't know. Now I'm just like, I'm trying to focus more on characters because I, I do love world building. That's why mm -hmm. I come back for, you know, lost civilizations in a fantasy world fascinate me. I'm writing like an Atlantean lost civilization in my world where they were around the whole planet and then nobody knows what happened to them. Because I like the, um, oh, like Oblivion and Morrowind where you go to the different, you know, ruins like the, the Dugar or whatever. Uh, yes. the dreamer or whatever you know those are just fun you know and I always like that but at the same time it's like I want to have my characters interact with those settings so I feel like that's one thing that's overarching that you can do cool things with but it's like at the same time I haven't figured out that race's entire history yet I just put a little something here something here and kind of like a puzzle yeah. you know even for myself so I think it'd be more fun for you know for readers to be like oh this is the ruin that was in this other trilogy or whatever and you know, or whatever. I, yeah, it's world building is one of those. I think a lot of people, like you said, just get stopped by it. And I think if you, like you said, just season it. Like I saw a really good one recently where starts off the book, a scene happened in this fantasy book that I was, I'm reading. And I really liked it because I saw what the author was doing. They walked by a statue mm -hmm. and that's when the world building happened. Like mm -hmm. the person thought of a time when they were in school and learned about this person who was a really big deal from this city and I was like that's really cool instead of you know exposition it's like it's a random thought right because I feel like that's something that I do you know on a daily basis like I'll be driving somewhere and think like 
um, you know, we got, I live in New York and the central New York and we have these huge mountains, you know, and I just think random stuff all the time. I'm like, oh, I wonder if the British ever traveled this route or something, you know, and okay. I feel like, I feel like we do that all the time without knowing it. And that's a very natural thing. So I definitely agree with you there. It's, it's I like that, that term seasoning. So <laughs> I think I might even get like a seasoning bottle and just do like world building on it and just keep yeah. it on my desk. You know what I mean? Like just to, just to remind myself, Absolutely. just to sprinkle yeah. it on. <laughs> yeah really and funny. also uh like another seasoning is uh, i guess the senses as well you know mm. so if you're yeah. describing something, mm. you don't need all of them you don't need them all of the time but as part of that seasoning i mean like you said it's when you mentioned about the character saw the statue and then had the thought if you make the world building relevant to that character or their experience it just it it means so much more than the skies here were purple. I mean, what relevance does that have to that character? Because yeah. you're in this character's eyes. And I remember I saw, uh, it was a years back. I don't remember who wrote it. I have the memory of a goldfish, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but it was um, it was writing advice about um, characters and world building. And it was uh, something to do with a character walking down a beach, okay? And depending on what that character is, who they are, they will see different things. Mm. An old sailor will recognize the seabirds by the shapes of them, and they will be able to tell where the fishing spots are, and they'll be able to tell if it's good water to sail on. Whereas a tourist will just see uh, the beautiful sand and maybe the new colors and feel the intense, of the intense heat or, or whatever it might be. So like as a, as a test of your own characters and your own world building, put you know, two or three of your characters in the same location. What do each of them see? And how does the world building affect them? Because, you know, you might have a, a character who's been chained up, locked up, and they see freedom for the first time. They're going to have a vastly different experience to uh, an area than a king or, you know, someone who's royal or a noble or whatever it might be. And you can get those little some subtle differences there. And the seasoning really helps with that because it's like, okay, what, what are the tiny little nuggets that are going to make this really um, visceral for this character? and therefore for the reader. And then you get to do world building and character growth all in the same scene mm -hmm. and without thinking specifically about, all right, must make this character feel real in this scene because it's it's just a natural part of how that writing works. Um, and yeah, whatever you do, always have to connect it to the character and then you get to kind of kill two birds with one stone yeah. type thinking. Yeah. Um, and I find, uh, when I read, uh, one thing that I, I do look for is what relevance does this have to the character whose POV we're in? Why are we? Te why is it this character's story? What? How does it impact them? And what do they get out of the world? Um, and I, you know, if 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 authors can do that well, then I think it's it makes it for such a it's more of an experience than a read of a book, if that makes sense. No, yeah, yeah, totally. I think it makes total sense. Yeah, it gets interesting when you really like i read one book and it was like it goes from character to character and i'm like is this the same character i literally said to my friend i was like i'm enjoying the story but i was like this character these three characters are actually one character and <laughs> you know what i mean like where they're interacting like and i read then i read a different book i got frustrated i went and read one of these other ones on kindle and they're in this marketplace and you have this thief right who is used to stealing in those situations. Well, he's on the lookout in this marketplace for thieves, you know, like pickpockets like himself, uh, like what he used to do. And he catches this street urchin like trying to go in his pocket. And then there's like a scholar with them, like mage like, and he's interested in all the different people because this is like a really big, you know, metropolitan area. Um, so he's looking at that. And then you have like the like the fighter, the leader, or whatever, and she's focused on, you know, like their mission. And nothing else really seems to matter other than trying to find this person. And I was like that it was a very short scene. And, you know, but I'm like, that was brilliantly done because, you know, you could literally get into each character's headspace. And it wasn't like, you know, 10 minutes of each character explaining. It was just like they're doing a different thing in this scene. And like, you know, they talk about it and then they kind of go off. But I was like, I just felt like it was really well done, especially after the other one I read. I was like, you know, I was I was I felt better. So I kept going with it. But yeah. Yeah, definitely true. It's a skill, it's a skill but yeah. it makes such a better reading experience. Yeah, no, totally. 
Um, so for that fourth question there, what are your dragon spirit books about? Okay, so I have written this down because every <laughs> time anyone asks me, what are your books about? I'm like, um, it's it's a book written with words. You are so ahead of anybody else we've had on. Everybody else is like, just look it in the air. I'm like, is it in front of you? <laughs> <laughs> no, so th 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 honestly, I'm, I'm nowhere without a notebook. I, I, I have to. So um, what are dragon spirits about? So it's, it's set in, all right. I'm a world builder, so I tend to talk more about the world than the characters, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get there. So it's set in a magic drenched world, which has given rise to powerful dragon spirits. So wherever there's an abundance of life, like a, a lake or a mountain, or an abundance of a natural material like iron, uh, a spirit can form. And in this world, all of the spirits, well, most of the spirits are dragons. So you will have a dragon spirit of a particular area and that's kind of their domain. So the spirit of a forest um, or, of, a, or of, a, of an ocean, which is obviously bigger, therefore it's more powerful. Um, and the book is called The Iron Crown. So it, it focuses also on the dragon spirit of iron, which is a, an abundant natural material. Mm. So, the iron is the dragon, the dragon is the iron, so any weapon with iron in it can be infused with the, the power of this spirit. So we have the iron uh, crown, which is the queen who has bonded with this dragon spirit of iron. Very, very powerful. Iron is obviously not something that you can fight easily against. Um, so you've kind of got these dragon spirits in these different areas, different domains. Some of them are very um, kind of protective of their domains. Uh, some of them try to help people that live there. Maybe some people come and live to, in the forest and they want to help them. And some dragons really don't care because <laughs> why would they? They're so powerful, you're nothing but ants to them. So it's kind of the dynamic there between the spirits and because they form wherever there's lots of life, they're kind of life spirits and their opposite are spirits of kind of death and decay and destruction. So it's kind of like, overarching life versus death and people are in the middle some of them are used as pawns some of them try to fight some of them don't care and it's just kind of that's the setting of the place um it's very magical i like reading books where there's lots of magic rather than the magic is dying out or it's long gone or anything i i like to be where it's very thick and strong and powerful yeah. because i find that so much more um, exciting to read about, I find it more exciting to write about because, all right, let's do curses, let's do blessings, let's have priests, let's have shrines, let's have all of these cool effects that you can't get in a dying world or something like that. Um, do, 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 let me read where I am. So that's that bit, the opposites, um, the Iron Queen. And then the story kind of takes place five years after these kind of spirits of death have been sort of banished from this continent. Mm. by the spirit of iron um, and then you've got lots of kind of what's called lost souls cropping up so these are people without any memories of anything other than their own name they don't know where they're from they don't know if they have friends or family they don't know if they're rich or poor and they're just kind of appearing for no apparent reason mm. um, and the queen uh, who is also a mage is sending her kind of police force to round up these lost souls and figure out what's going on. Uh, our story takes place, um, well, there's four main protagonists, but the main, the, 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 the real leader of the story is one of these lost souls. So he's very driven to figure out what's going on. He's trying to avoid the queen's inquisitors. He's trying to navigate all these spirits who are kind of interested in him, but sort of not. And whether or not he might be related to these spirits of death that are rumored to be resurging. So it's, although it's epic fantasy, I would say it's kind of an intimate story, mm. their own struggles, while you have the bigger plot that's kind of happening around them. Um, and I, I know that that may not be everybody's cup of tea. Some people want to have characters that are, you know, driving the epic scale battles and really kind of important to that. Whereas I wanted to tell the story of kind of average people dealing with these changes and being affected by these um, world shattering events. Um, and it will kind of grow with, with books two and three, but the first book is very much a story about these characters. The world is changing, the magic seems to be changing, figuring out what's going on, figuring out each other um, and kind of growing from there. So you've got the lost soul, you've got a retired thief whose past is catching up with him. You've got a woman who's 
uh, kind of estranged from her family and has a big chip on her shoulder and is used to running away from things, but some things you can't always run away from. <laughs> Um, and then you have one of the Queen's Inquisitors who is also bonded with the dragon and whether he has his own or the Queen's best intentions kind of at heart is, is uncertain. So you've kind of got different perspectives from different hierarchies of the world as, as to how it's impacting them. Um, but it's definitely more of an intimate story than we're f first in line on the battlefield kind of thing. Um, but I love the scope of epic fantasy. I love the idea that the world can be changing and it can affect regular people and what those stories might look like. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I don't know, I wouldn't say that's in a nutshell, but that's uh, <laughs> an overview of what the series is about. Yeah, so life and death spirits and how people cope with the changes of, of balance and power, I guess. I always, it's always funny to ask that question because then I, as you're talking, I, I just like go, usually when people say it, I go like three words, usually like, I'm like, yep, I'm in. And <laughs> they were a thief, dragon, and inquisitor. <laughs> I'm like, check, check, <laughs> check. <laughs> well, fantastic. <laughs> it's funny, you know, like I, um, so I just asked that question too, because first of all, your cover is amazing. Um, but your blurb was really awesome. Um, particular, I don't know if it's the same on Amazon and Goodreads, but I went to Goodreads because I love Goodreads. Um, but I loved your blurb on there. So if anybody has a, a chance to check it out, it is the Iron Crown. Uh, book looks amazing, sounds amazing. But when what really drew me was really at the bottom here, a new high fantasy series bursts into life with the dragon spirits who reign supreme in the magic drenched world of, how do you say it? Is it Tassar? Yeah, exactly. Just saw. Yeah, that that line was just like, I was like, yep, because I was skimming, and then I was like, okay, 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 and then when I got to that line, I was like, yep, <laughs> Kindle <laughs> right now. Uh, so yeah, that's really cool. And I saw if it was yours where I saw a review, but somebody had, or maybe we use you said something somewhere on social media, but uh, about. Um, one of the characters and I was just like yep that's my cup of tea because my thing is like there's so many battles like you want big battle scenes and epic scope like go read Wheel of Time like I you know being a historian I, I really do like because I was wondering you know like about the other people that aren't mentioned in the history books you know and um, more and more to me that is more fascinating um, you know so if anybody wants a huge I guess same thing like a huge scope and earth shattering like I have earth shattering things that happen around my characters and characters to them but not necessarily like you know it really only affects them in their immediate area not all of time or their entire planet or something you know I'll maybe do that later when I get less bored with that topic but but yeah I like how you know you said everyday people and yeah. you know that's what that's the whole point of Tolkien right and you know the Hobbit and you know the Lord of the Rings is that like everyday people can like that was his whole point with the hobbits you know everyday people can make a difference so i think that especially in our world today that's a really good theme that you went with so to me that just that makes it way way more interesting than no offense to him, but just another fantasy book because yeah. there's a lot out there so it is it's kind of uh the idea of that everyday people focus is very opposite to the chosen one i guess yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. which has been know, done a lot <laughs> it, has, it has and there's nothing wrong with it no. done well popular for a reason but i think you don't always want to have a prophecy or special half this, half that super magic powers no one's ever seen before. I like the idea of someone just caught in the wrong place at the wrong time and yeah, how yeah, they yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, and people with regular lives and regular pasts, they've done maybe things they shouldn't have done and the consequences of that. Um, and if it ties into a bigger plot, uh, great, um, but it doesn't have to. Um, and I, I don't know if there's a name for that idea of, normal people I don't know if the, the trope has been defined but I, I love it I really really enjoy reading about it yeah. um probably why I picked it for my book <laughs> to be honest um yeah no I get but it I, I, cup of tea. I, I get yeah. some people like more agency rather than just characters surviving and coping yeah. and making bad decisions yeah. um but I don't know yeah like you say it's, it's just kind of more interesting yeah, well, I think that's why people enjoy critical role so much, you know, like mm -hmm. you have these characters, particularly with the TV series, you know, maybe versus like now they're, you know, they're, they're campaign one, they got pretty powerful. But, you know, at least in terms of the, you know, the, the, the cartoon series, like, I thought they did such a great job with season one of like, 
making them so each of them is skilled in their own way but like not overpowered and like really they're just bumbling through life and they do do some earth shattering things but half of it's not even on purpose and it just it made it so much better writing wise than than being all Gandalf you know in their own way and I think that's what has drawn people you know to the you know to the cartoon um versus you know a little bit more, I would even say then, you know, then, you know, people came for the people, you know, playing mm. them, but I was really drawn. I was like, okay, I listened to it a lot. Um, especially I love Matt Mercer and his, you know, his, um, storytelling style. He's like just epic in my mind. He's the modern day bard, if you will, like Shakespeare yeah. in my mind, like he does and he, he can't do anything wrong. Um, <laughs> but it's just so interesting. My friend brought that up the other day. He was like, he goes, I like it because literally like Scanlon, like, does a thing and f's up and then ends up helping with this other thing but it's not even on purpose and i'm like that that is true and so i, I feel like they're more everyday heroes than legendary icons but yeah i, I do agree with it. i think it it makes it more fun and yeah. it makes it so you can relate to the characters more mm-hmm. yeah you know because I'm, I'm no gandalf you know as much as i want to say i am but you know <laughs> if i'm like <laughs> yeah right yeah make my life a lot easier that's for sure um so how do you, how did you go about writing your blurbs? Because that one on Goodreads in particular was really good. So is there anything specific or formula that you're following? Like, how did you get a good blurb like that? Well, thank you. Thank you. Because I, I'm, I, I hate writing blurbs. I hate it. <laughs> Let me write a 200,000 word story any day over you're a- like the 10th person to say that in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> They're awful. I hate yeah, them. Yeah. Because well, we're used to writing what we want to write, right? And then all of a sudden now you have to do this little itty. Yeah. <laughs> I always think of like Robin Williams, like itty bitty living space. Like it's like the same thing. Like it it's is, totally true. It is. Um, so I write them with great difficulty and they go through many, many, many revisions um, and many pairs of eyes and like a couple of critiquing friends, I guess. Um, so I try, I try and focus on one or two main characters, which can be difficult with epic fantasy because there's yeah. usually a large cast. Yeah. There's usually more than two POVs. Um, but I also have to remember that blurbs are for readers, they're not for me. So even though I love world building and even though world building features in my blurbs, most people want to connect to at least one character. So it ha- the blurb has to be character driven. It has to be uh, relatable and um, uh, clear. So it's, it's always about clarity, really. Why, why, why is this character important enough to be on the blurb? So I try and focus on the main characters, their stakes, and drip feed a little bit of world building highlights in where possible. Um, I do still think I need to improve. Uh, personally, I'm really glad you said you liked uh, the Iron Crown blurb. That that yeah. brings me great amounts of joy because I still look at it and think, mm, I could tweak it, mm, could be better. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's just the writing curse. Um, so yeah, pick a couple of characters and what's the, the crux of their story? What are they trying to do? So Fen wakes up with no memory, that has to start. There's dragon spirits, that has to feature. Um, and then uh, I talk about Kalidra as well, because she's one of the, there's four POVs, but Fen and Kalidra are the main two. So I talk about how she comes in and how their stories kind of intertwine a little bit, but keeping it vague. So I just try and, and get the, this is the situation. This is what they have to do. This is what will happen if they don't do it. And if I can add in some world building nuggets to draw people in, AKA dragon spirits and vengeful spirits and all of those keywords, all the better. Um, I, 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 I presume copywriting has helped with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've written something and been told, yes, this is perfect, 100% brilliant, we love it. Can you do the same thing in half the word space? And I'm like, <laughs> sure. Um, I was even told once, I had a whole sentence and they're like, brilliant, can we have all of that with one word? And I'm like, I will do my best, but okay. Um, so I am very used to kind of, stripping things down, getting to the core of the message. Um, Where I struggle with is what's important to me is not necessarily important to the readers. So I struggle with, I just wanna talk about the world building and the magic and the spirits and how awesome that is. And people are like, well, why do I care about this character? So I need to make sure that I get the character emotion in and that's where the feedback really helps. Um, Because yeah, I I am very much, uh, just give me an amazing world 
and I care less for the characters, but the blurb really has to be character focused. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, all a blurb has to do is get somebody to click look inside or read the first page if it's, you know, they have the physical copy there. Yeah. That's all a blurb needs to do. It doesn't have to sell the entire story, doesn't have to do any more than uh, intriguing people. So as long as it does that, it's working and I'm happy. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very long process. It's something I leave until the very end. I try not to do it before because um, much like you, you, you have a plan and then you come to write it and the plan is out the window and it's more of a guideline. So if you write the blurb before, you might end up writing mm. a different story. Yeah, so yeah. I try to save the blurb until the end and then I know the important things that I probably need to put in there. Um, so yeah, I don't have a template as such. I just try to keep it 100 to 150 words. Um, I write maybe 300 words and then strip back to the mm. to the core essence. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, and I'll do a couple of different versions, like one that focuses more on world building, one that focuses more on characters, one that focuses more on a, another aspect and just get some feedback on what's hookier um, mm. and, and go with that. And I, I will tweak it as it goes. Um, haven't tweaked this one, um, but I but I, I might. I might in the future. I don't know. I just say it. I'm not an expert on them, but I see a lot of them. I look at a lot of them. I study a lot of them. Um, I just thought you had a great mix of oh. world building, characters, plot, you know, and then that, like I said, that end part there. I was just, especially where you said like surrounded by vengeful spirits, powerful magic, then yeah. desperate attempt to find his way home might well alter the fate of Tassar and every power in it. I mean, it was yeah. like, I felt <laughs> like you hit all the key points there. Miles Hurt and I talked about that. Um, he was nice enough to send me his template. Um, so I'll be using that in the future, but it's like, I feel like you had all the good stuff there. So um, yeah, yeah but I, I thought that was a really good one. I liked it a lot. Yeah. Oh, and one other thing, I tried to end the sentence on a cool sounding word. So I've um, heard that a lot recently. Yeah, if you can, because it's got to make you want to read the next sentence. So I think yeah. like the, sentence, the last paragraph ends uh, with like war's resurgence. And so you try and structure yep. the sentence. So it kind of is like, Oh, that's a nice wet sounding word. Oh, that could be something. So you just try and put something in each paragraph to, mm. you know, what's the hook of each paragraph? So like vengeful spirits is the last one, war's resurgence. Um, you know, you've got like avoid the queen's inquisitors. That's that's a, a challenge that anyone can relate to, even if you don't yeah. know what an inquisitor is. It's so trying to put something like that in. That's the point of the paragraph is mm. something I'll try and bear in mind as well. Sorry, just remembered that. No, no, no. I like that. Yeah, because it really does. Like, it really did make me want to go keep reading the blurb. Because if your blurb, the first part, right, doesn't make you want to read the next part, like, you already lost them. So, yeah, that's, I've heard that a lot recently. So I'm glad you brought that up. That's like one thing that um, is on my list to start studying for different blurbs and stuff for this summer. But yeah, it's yeah. a, a great point. I forgot to check that out some more. I like that. Uh, so, okay, this was so cool. I don't even know where I saw this. I think I went to your website. Uh, so yeah. who did your animated covers for your website? Uh, so they I were have... super cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love them. Um, so I did a book tour last year, I think, um, with, uh, oh my God, the name has just gone from my mind. I don't remember. But they did stop doing the tours now, so it doesn't matter as much. <laughs> <laughs> but they recommended... Uh, like uh, they put a pack together of graphics and what have you um, and they recommended a graphic designer who did uh, animated covers and I reached out to her and I loved what she did so I used her and uh, I am using her again for another cover of a book I've got coming out hopefully fingers crossed next month um, and it's a company called Motion Kitty mm. and uh, my contact there is a lady called Suzanne she's fantastic she's based in the UK as well which is always great with quick questions because you get a quick answer because she's not asleep or it's not 3 a.m when she emails me um and yeah she does a fantastic job she did a few different variants she'll do um instagram posts and social media posts as well cool. so you can post the animated i suppose it's a gif at that point um wherever you need um and she she, she, she does a variety of different things you can add different elements um and you know she'll talk to you about what you want brought out on the cover and any elements and she's very very creative and she she always comes up with brilliant ideas so yeah motion kitty is uh fantastic and i highly recommend them yeah yeah that's cool i'm gonna have to check that out if you guys um have not um checked out lauren's website yet please do because yeah as soon as i saw those animated covers i was like 
oh wow it's like that's really cool and you know you yeah. see some and you know they're they're pretty neat but yours in particular like really pop so they yeah. you know she, they did a really good job she did an amazing job uh so yeah. how many books do you plan in the dragon spirit books and have you decided yet or is that going to be like an ongoing decision um so the main series is going to be a trilogy so the oh, cool. iron is the first book and there'll be two more uh there is already a prequel novella Oh, cool. uh, it's free if you subscribe to my website mm. um but if you would like to support me with a 99 cent uh purchase on amazon you can grab it there too oh cool um, it's set i think it's set five years before events of the first book oh, cool. um i love focuses, novellas so. <laughs> now it focuses on the thief character he's the only pov oh, cool. um his name is apollo and even people who don't like the book love him so mm. i've done something right with him can't tell you what it was um so I'm probably going to do a couple other novellas just kind of spin off stories to kind of dive into a couple of the side characters um so yeah main one will be a trilogy I might do a follow-up duology after but that's I'm still on the fence we'll see how mm. neatly it wraps up yeah um, yeah main trilogy definitely and some spin-offs because oh, I, cool. I quite enjoy the universe yeah 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 that's like um, one of those things like so yeah yeah yeah. I always wonder that for people because like you know like I'm planning certain things and I'm like my friend he's like you're horrible he goes you always just pre-plan to I said well for you know for for strategy's sake I said even if there's like let's say you only have one of the main character like one of the main characters survived your trilogy I'm like mm -hmm. maybe something else happens later you know I'm like what if people really like it like I think that's one thing that you know like particularly like I want to do um I'd like to do hybrid my historical urban fantasy I'm trying to I would love Athon books if they're watching um to buy that one um but yeah like I am planning that as a trilogy but if people like it I have it because I'm tr turning in the my Roman peeps there um who survived book one you know they survived because one of the guys is telling the story um but um I'd like it to be like a, a longer series like Iron Drew Chronicles or Patricia Briggs, Mercy Thompson, but if people don't like it, then, or they like it somewhat, I guess it's three, but yeah, I always, it always fascinates me how people pick. Some people lately have been doing, you know, four or five, a duology. Um, that whole process to me is just interesting to hear how people decide. So that's very cool. I think as long as you can wrap it up. So even if it's yeah. not so popular, the people that do like it get closure. Yeah, um, yeah. But then you leave the door open, like you say, if there's a character at the end of it, who can continue or have their own story then the door is open for that i guess yeah um or even if they're not alive by the end of it you can always do prequels so yeah, there's yeah. you know there's always options um, i love prequel trilogies too like i go through like because that's like basically what um i, I love like david eddings with the belgariad and malorian yeah. like I, I just i actually read the the later one um the Malorian and then I went back and read the Belgariad and I was just like oh so then I like really got addicted to prequel trilogies so I was like had a lot of success with reading both of those so yeah that's awesome uh so for that last one do you have any news updates promos or current projects that you'd like to share with us I do have a couple yes um I always feel really weird when I'm like this is a cool thing that I have going on <laughs> I don't know it's always very like I want to tell but you don't want to tell but I have a couple oh, tell things. us tell us <laughs> <laughs> this is like the the prime opportunity so yeah. um the Iron Crown audiobook is oh, being cool. rated by RJ Bailey a lot of people have been asking me about that um I did have another narrator and it was supposed to be out back in December but for various reasons it didn't happen and then we parted ways and then RJ came on board which is fantastic because he's amazing and his audition just blew me out of the water um, so he'll be starting on that uh, pretty soon mm. and it should be out this summer. I'm hoping by the end of July, um, but I will definitely be shouting about it as soon as that's available. So yes, audiobook oh, cool. is coming. Don't worry, people have been mm -hmm. chasing me. Yeah, it's in production. Um, the sequel to The Iron Crown will also be out later this year. Um, probably looking for a, an autumn, maybe winter release. We'll see how we get on. But yeah, book two is also coming. That was also supposed to be out in March, but uh life yeah, yeah. Away. so i had to cancel the pre-order but again i'll shout about it um the maroda so maroda is the first book of my world of lunaria uh, series oh. uh, i mentioned motion kitty was doing another animated cover for me 
that is the cover. Oh, that's so cool. um, I used to publish under a different author name. I, I now only publish under McRae. So I was republishing my backlist. Mm. Uh, as I mentioned in the earlier parts of the interview, Mered was very rough around the edges. It was my debut, didn't really know what I was doing, hadn't planned it. So I have basically rewritten it as, and I'm going to re-release it as a second edition. Oh, that's with cool. With my new author name, new cover, animated cover. There's going to be a book tour for it. It's going to be a, a whole awesome, exciting thing. Um, so that I'm hoping will be out next month, if not early part of June, but it's coming very, very soon. So if anyone has read The Iron Crown and maybe wants to read more of my stuff, just hold fire for a couple of weeks and then the second edition will be out and that's going to be amazing. And there's already four books out in that series. If you like it, you've got three more books, chunky, oh, chunky cool. books to read. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, I do have a Patreon. I hate talking about my Patreon, but I do have a Patreon. Uh, there's a read by the author mini series. So I read uh, early drafts of my current books obviously I'm not a voice actor but you can hear me read it I also read it all of my novellas as well oh, so you cool. get to hear that because they they don't have an audio uh, audiobook version mm. um there's a whole exclusive story there called shadow light it's kind of dark fantasy you've got alchemy you've got mages you've got a blighted world you've got phoenixes it's really quite cool um and finally um check out SPFPO it's the last six days of this year's competition. Iron Crown is a finalist. I'm very stressed and, and very nervous. <laughs> and very um, but if you have released a book, SPFPO 8 will open next month, I believe. So consider getting the manuscript ready and applying to that because that is awesome fun. And that was everything. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's awesome. Uh, so you're, so we're going to put this episode and you guys will already um, be listening to it, hopefully by then, uh, on May 10th. Um, so I do want to say, you know, keep us in mind, like I said, for the future, you know, if you, you know, you got book two and you're ready to go, or you got something that, you know, news to share for it, or you want to, you know, come back in the summer and talk about pre-orders or something like that. Um, you know, please keep us in mind. Um, thank you so much. I, I got a lot of notes. If you saw me looking down, I was writing. So I been doing that a lot lately and I feel like, like end up getting a lot more out of it, even if it's just a little bit here and there. So I really want to thank you for coming. Um, I was really excited to see your book shared so many times on Twitter. And um, I was like, oh, I'm just going to ask, you know, you never know. So, <laughs> so I was really yeah. happy to get you on and, um, you know, good luck with the rest of the contest. And, you know, we wish you all the best. And if there's anything we can do to help you out at all, you know, you, you tag me anytime and I'll share whatever. I think people are always afraid to tag me. They, they think I have a lot going on, but it's a lot easier yeah. for me to to do it now with the Twitter algorithm being what it is. So feel free to tag me anytime and I will share, 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 share on all of our social media sites. And uh, yeah, I will be sending you um, these links and everything. Make sure you guys um, check out Lauren's socials in the description anywhere where you found this podcast. And if you you know want to send her any questions or just tell her how amazing she is or her books are, um, you can you know, go through those socials or you can, you know, go right through our email. You guys know where to find us. Um, Lauren, I hope you have a great rest of the day and I look forward to seeing you on social media, my friend. Well, thank you so much. It's been so much fun. I'm nowhere near as nervous as I thought I would be. So <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> Super awesome. Really appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Come back anytime. Like I said, I will be sending out, um, that's what they're called panels. I do want to do some, some panels. So, um, if you want to, you know, um, I'll be sending people out surveys, uh, for that, you know, so if you want to do a copy editing one, you just you're tired of that, you want to do a world building one, um, you know, just let me know. We'll be doing a couple world building sessions and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, so I look forward to having you back in the future. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. You have a good rest of the day, and I will talk to you later. You too. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.